Season four of The Chosen is about to release and it feels like forever since the last episode of season three. So what are the things that you need to know before you start watching the new season? What are some important details that you might have forgotten? What are some key insights that you might have missed? And what are the biblical connections you need to remember and look out for as you dive into season four? Well, if you want to find out, then join me for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before we start, if you're interested in learning more insights that will help you to understand the Bible more clearly and see it with an entirely new set of eyes, then make sure to click the link up here and down in the description where you can download a free book I wrote called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. It's a quick but powerful read that will teach you a whole lot in just a short period of time, just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. One of the topics that season three brings to the fore is the question of why Jesus came and what people are expecting of him. And in episode five, that question of why really begins to become more clear. As Gaius and Simon are working on a cistern, Simon says that he feels like he's experiencing prophecy unfolding around him. He references a verse from Jeremiah where Jeremiah says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. And what we see highlighted here in this verse is a Jewish understanding of the difference between living water and other water. As Simon and Gaius are working, they're using pallets and mortar and other tools to construct and seal their cistern. Now, just in case you're not familiar with the term, a cistern was a vessel constructed to hold water. In Israel, water isn't always abundant. Rain occurs in seasons. In some places, it only rains a few times a year. Even today, Israel only gets about 20 inches of rain a year. And so in order to survive, people would build cisterns to retain the water. When the rains or the floods came, they would divert the water into these cisterns and drink from that water until the next rain came. But naturally, there was a problem with this. Some cisterns would leak or break, like Jeremiah says, or things would get into the cisterns. They could be contaminated by feces or even dead animals, and an entire water supply would be ruined, just like it is in this episode. Cistern water was stagnant. It wasn't fresh. It was easily ruined. It was the total opposite of living water. Living water refers to streams and rivers. It's water that flows and moves. It's always fresh, always clean. But there's also another big difference between cisterns and living water. Cisterns are water we prepare for ourselves and living water is provided by the Lord. And this, this is the key to the whole episode. Because what Jeremiah is saying and what Jesus comes to show the people is that they have been living off of the cistern. They have become content with cisterns. They're content looking to things other than the Lord for life. Families look to doctors to heal. Mourners are used to address the family's grief. Priests trust ritual baths to cleanse. But these are all cisterns. And Jesus says, I'm not here to give you more cisterns. Jesus says, I've come to give you living water. But here's the reality. Different people have different ideas of what that will look like of what will truly save them. And this becomes abundantly apparent in episode six. When James and John come to get Simon after being approached by John the Baptist's disciples, James suggests that they need to be careful, that these men could be from any one of the four philosophies, or even from Rome. Now, in the past, we've heard zealots referred to as the fourth philosophy, but here, they're worried about each of the four philosophies. And what they're referring to here are four groups named by the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, Essenes, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Zealots. The Essenes were an ascetic group that generally lived outside of society. They shared all of their property in common, they didn't marry, and they were generally all male. They were extremely devoted to the law, and they were among the most strict of all Jewish sects, believing heavily in purity, taking frequent ritual baths. Many believe that John the Baptist and his followers at least had connections with the Essenes. The Sadducees were quite different. They were known for their wealth and their influence. They were less strict in their interpretations of the law than the Pharisees and the Essenes, but they were also much harsher in their judgment of those who broke it. And when it came to the law, the Sadducees only accepted the written law, rejecting the oral traditions. They also denied the existence of the soul and resurrection, and they didn't believe in angels or spirits. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, at the time of Jesus, the Sadducees were in charge of maintaining the temple. Next, we have the Pharisees. 
They were by far the most influential of all the philosophies. They were highly respected and supported by the general Jewish population. They were known to be experts in the law and strictly followed both the written law and the oral traditions. They believed that if people could faithfully obey the law and remove sin from their midst, then God would send the Messiah. The fourth philosophy, on the other hand, believed in a different means of ushering in the Messiah. And by fourth philosophy, I mean the Zealots. Zealots trace their name from the Hebrew word kenah, which means zeal and jealousy. We see it in verses like Numbers 25:11, where Phinehas slew an Israelite man who brought a Midianite woman into the congregation of Yah because he was as zealous among them as God was. And it's in this verse that we really get a sense of the zealot movement and their approach. They wanted to purify Israel by removing everyone and everything, sometimes including their fellow Israelites, that they believed was causing the people to turn away from God. Because of this, there were mixed feelings about zealots. Some saw them as freedom fighters, others saw them as violent murderers. But here is what connects each of these groups. They each have a different philosophy about what will save the people. The Essenes believe that it will be found in a cloistered community. The Sadducees believe that it will come through their power and their influence. Pharisees believe that it will be through being perfect in the law. And Zealots believe that it will come through violence. And Jesus says, none of these are correct, right? That's not the living water that I'm bringing. But here's where things get even trickier. While these groups might disagree on what the Messiah will look like and what will cause him to come, they can all agree on one thing. They all believe that he's coming for them, not the Gentiles. But in episode 7, we learn why that could not even possibly be true. You see, at one point, Matthew says that he's doing research into Jesus' lineage. And when he says this, he's actually referring to something that will appear in Matthew's gospel itself. In fact, it will open Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel begins, This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, for most Christians, this is the part of Matthew's gospel that they immediately skip. It's just a bunch of names. And the story of an angel coming to Mary is way more interesting verses later. But to a first century Jewish person, this lineage is actually fascinating. In Jewish culture, your lineage was an important form of introduction. It told who you were, where you came from. It either explained the greatness from which you descended or the shame from which you were running. Which makes Jesus' lineage really interesting. Because Jesus' lineage is filled with people who shouldn't be there. There are sinful people in Jesus' lineage. There are terrible kings who are listed. And like Matthew says, there are Gentiles. Now, remember how Matthew opened his gospel? This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Why would you mention the Gentiles in the family line of the Jewish Messiah? That's like including the names of your ex-girlfriends in your wedding vows, right? Just doesn't seem like it should go there. But that is the point that Matthew's trying to make in his gospel. For centuries, people believed that the Jewish Messiah was coming to save just Jewish people. The Messiah wouldn't come to save the Gentiles. The Messiah was coming to save the Jewish people from the Gentiles. From Gentiles who oppressed them. From Gentiles who took that land that God had given to them. From Gentiles who were leading their people away from the Lord. Those Gentiles, they believed, weren't worthy of the Messiah. They were the problem. But what I want you to understand is that this is how people thought at the time. This is what was going through their minds and through the minds of the disciples as they're being sent to places like the Decapolis. This is the refrain that they've heard their entire lives. But this issue of who is in and who is out didn't just apply to the Gentiles. It didn't just apply to slaves and free persons. It ran even deeper. You see, in the Jewish community, the question of who is in and who is out was also directly tied to sin. You see, there was also a belief at the time of Jesus that sin had a direct impact on whether or not the Messiah even came. Religious leaders would read texts like the Wisdom of Solomon, which says, And there shall be no unrighteousness in them on this day, for they shall all be holy, and their king shall be the Lord Messiah. Passages like this inspire the Pharisees to believe that the Messiah couldn't come until all were righteous. They believed that everyone had to be perfect before the Messiah would even come. And because of this, 
They would ostracize those who they believed were bringing sin into the community, including sick people. This explains why the man on the horse, Nashon, says that the deaf man was being punished for a sin committed by him or his parents. He shares the belief at that time that sickness was directly connected to sin. People thought that diseases like blindness and leprosy must be punishment for something you or your ancestors did. In some cases, you would be shunned by your community because of this. This is why Jesus gets in trouble for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. He's hanging out with sinful people, which means that he's hanging out with people who are preventing the Messiah from coming. As far as they're concerned, these people are supposed to be out of the community. They have no value in society. In fact, they're the opposite. They're preventing the one that everyone's hoping for. But of course, as we all know, those people who believe that are wrong. Jesus isn't preventing the Messiah by being with these people. Jesus is the Messiah who has come to save these people. Jesus didn't just come to save this part of the Sea of Galilee. He came to save all of it. He came to be the Messiah for all people, even the slaves, even the zealots, even the Gentiles, and even the sick. He came for all. And this is something that becomes very clear in episode 8. But not actually through something that Jesus says or does. Rather, through someone who appears for only a brief moment, a shepherd. Now, the first thing that you may have noticed about the shepherd is that she's female. Often, when we imagine shepherds at the birth of Jesus, for instance, we imagine men or young boys. But the reality is that it was incredibly common for women to be shepherds. In the Old Testament, Jacob's wife, Rachel, was a shepherd. And this is because shepherding was a lowly task. It was necessary, but not highly respected. So, if there were daughters in a family, they'd be put in charge of tending to the sheep, while the men went and did more important work. But the other thing you might have noticed about this shepherd, and this is even more important, is that she is in Judea, a region that is filled with desert. And that's because, contrary to what we might think, sheep are primarily kept in the desert in Israel. And Jesus' audience in Galilee would have understood why. Remember, Jesus is speaking to an agrarian audience, people who farm and tend the land. He just told a parable about planting crops in this episode. And one thing farmers would know is that sheep need to be kept far away from crops. Sheep will eat and eat and eat until a shepherd forces them to stop eating. They will eviscerate a crop. So instead, sheep were primarily kept in the desert, which gives King David's 23rd Psalm an entirely new look. You see, King David wasn't just a king, he grew up as a shepherd. And David didn't just listen to the psalms, he wrote them. And the 23rd Psalm is filled with his memories of his life as a shepherd. He remembers the desert land where he guided his sheep, and he remembers the details that are lost on most of us. Like how the green pastures in Judea aren't endless fields of lush grass, they're patches of grass along the side of a mountain. Not enough for the sheep to glutton themselves on, just enough for today. And the paths of righteousness that he talks about aren't spiritual practices, like we tend to imagine. They're actually literal paths on the side of a mountain. Shepherds will lead their sheep along the paths of righteousness. The mountains themselves are jagged and dangerous, but the paths are smooth and straight. And as the sheep walk along these paths, they don't actually watch where they're going. Instead, they graze on the green pastures, the tufts of vegetation on the side of the mountain, and they follow the voice of their shepherd. And this, this is why this shepherd is so important in this episode. Because this is the answer to the problem the disciples have been facing. They see what Jesus is doing, but they're following other voices. The voices of doubt inside of their minds. The voices of their past that tell them, this is how you should respond and this is what you should think. But the true answer to what they're going through, the one thing that they truly need to do, is follow their shepherd's voice. And this is still the case today. If anything we've seen in episode 8, it's that it's not easy to follow Jesus. The road is not always easy. The journey is not always safe. But just like the sheep on the side of the mountain, the only way we can make this journey is to follow the voice of our shepherd. So where do you need to follow the voice of your shepherd right now? Where in your life has Jesus been saying, trust me, but you've been tempted to listen to other voices? 
Or do you need to fully surrender yourself to Jesus, to trust him above all others, to let him be your living water, your good shepherd, your Messiah, and your Savior, and to follow him wherever he asks you to go? Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before you go, make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download my free book called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see others like it, then just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.